Welcome to your first unit lecture on the Romantic period. Um, you will know, notice that everything I talk about in this lecture, and I'm really kind of glazing over a lot of the stuff from the textbook, but everything that I talk about is the information that you will read in the Norton Anthology of English Literature in the Romantic period introduction. This is from page 3 through 27. Um, there's going to be content that the book talks about that I don't discuss, of course. I'm not going to go through everything. I can't remember it all anyway. Um, and then there might be some, I guess, additional items that I address that uh, the book doesn't cover or that I explain in my own way that isn't, isn't quite explained exactly the same in the textbook. Um, but just know that you you certainly don't have to watch all of this lecture if you're 100% reading through the textbook, but this might be able to help you better understand the content in the textbook or give you a better framework for it. Um, and then also this section of the, the readings for this week is what the quiz is based on and the quiz 100% is based directly out of the textbook. So again, I might emphasize some things, but um, you don't have to watch this video in order to 100%, you know, to do well on the quiz or to get all the questions right. So I just want to kind of give everybody a heads up on that. Um, this is again on the romantic period. And so what defines romanticism? Um, what other uh, periods of literature are defined as is a little bit different from Romanticism. So sometimes it'll be the beginning and the end of a century and it will just, you know, be like the 17th century literature or 16th century literature or something like that. Other times what defines a literary period will be dependent upon, particularly regarding British lit, who the reigning monarch is at the time. So our next unit is the Victorian period because Queen Victoria was um, the reigning monarch. And there are scholars who disagree and say, well, the Victorian predates or postdates Queen Victoria herself and her reign. Um, but that's kind of the, the ruling force there. And we see that, you know, with the Elizabethan age. And, and then we also um, see that with like our last section regarding time frame. It's just the 20th century and after. Um, and again, the, the Victorian period doesn't exactly end right at 1900. Um, so what about Romanticism? Well, what we're looking at here is really just kind of what's going on politically in the country and, and with Britain compared to other places. So there is some debate on exactly when the Romantic period begins, but what we're seeing here is sort of like late 18th century. Um, so some theorists argue that when America claimed its independence is when the Romantic period began. And again, we're talking about British lit. Um, other people, other theorists will say, well, actually, when the British military was defeated by the American military is when the Romantic period um, came about. So not when they first declared independence, but when they add like post-war, essentially. Um, and then other people will say, no, it's even later than that. N let's not worry too much about American and British politics. Let's talk more about sort of like this um, democratic revolution in France because that is causing political unrest in Britain um, and it's causing war and that's giving people something to write about and you're going to see this connection between what's going on politically with what's happening in the literature. Um, pretty much though regardless of what the historians and the, the literary theorists say about the beginning of the Romantic period, they all classify the ending right at 1832. Okay, um, what happened in 1832? I don't know, but I bet your history teacher would, so I would ask them. Um, so what else defines romanticism? I mean, if we're looking at, okay, there's political stuff going on, political turmoil, and that's why um, the the texts were written in, in the ways that they were. Well, also some of the things that define romanticism and, and the types of writing that are particularly romantic, so to speak, and it's not about love and and um, certainly not overt sexual tones or anything like that, but first and foremost, 100%, you're looking at lyric poetry. Lyric poetry 
defines romanticism. Um, our textbook really covers like, this concept of lyric poetry being more freeform. It discusses this idea that at this point in time, um, poets started to think not so much about form and structure and, and working that poem until it was 100% perfect and kind of showed this poetic genius. Um, poets said, well, maybe real, raw, true poetry is spontaneous and impulsive and I, you know, you get this inspiration to write poetry and you write poetry and you, it's like you have this muse. Um, and so the lyric poem is really kind of addressing or you see that impulsive, spontaneous um, form of poetry here introspective lyric poems, so not talking about the outside world, but really kind of figuring out what's going on in the inside of the poet, the mind, the psyche, um, and this can also mean the inside of the world, like what, digging further, really digging into the themes and the concepts and asking questions about society and things like that. Why is this happening? I think that the poetry of the time, these introspective lyric poems, speak to that. Um, then we also see, almost like the pastoral, poems about objects and nature. So you're going to see things like odes, odes to items like urns and animals. Um, you're going to see poems about really kind of scenic places or poems about animals. Um, not necessarily just odes to the animals, poems about them. Um, but that's not all. So I think that's really where it starts, but that's not the only definition of romanticism. So romanticism also encompasses all of these other things because not only are our romantic poets looking at our objective world, but they're also trying to figure out like what's up with this other weird stuff. So you're going to see abolitionist songs, ballads, and ballad imitations. You're going to see Turkish tales. Not exactly sure what our book means by that, but they talk about it in there. Um, fairy tales in poetic form. So instead of prose, um, short stories, you're really going to see sort of fairy tales coming out and in, in poetry. Um, <clears throat> nature or animals are going to be personified in poetry in the form of the poets are giving voice to the nature, giving voice to the trees or the, the sea, giving voice to animals like mice, something like that. Um, you'll also notice that our book talks of really quickly about travelogues and I think the best way to explain that is to use a contemporary example which is the book Wild so you know someone who's traveling and writing about their experiences these are really popular um, I think that there is just this there's a blend at this time period or an overlap at this time period that we see not only with British lit but also with American lit and we really even see it in contemporary times. There are plenty of authors who write about their experiences in nature and even traveling through nature. Table talk, I think, again, I'm, I'm quoting straight out of the book here, I think what the book is referring to by table talk is this idea of just ordinary conversation that happens around the table um, and poets making that into something. So a lot of what you're going to see with romantic poetry particularly is turning the ordinary into something worth analyzing and writing about. Um, then there's also gothic novels, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, and historical romances, which I can't even think of any examples for you, but our book does address them. All right, um, so one really lovely thing about the Romantic period, and, I, and it's certainly not... Um, the Romantic period does not own this phenomenon, but they blend art and activism. And um, sort of what I want to talk about here is like, why do they blend art and activism? Well, they have a lot of stuff going on, historical context for you. They have a lot of stuff going on that they want to write about. Um, and I can only imagine being in this time period, and I'm going to talk about, I guess, in a few minutes, just how I still see things like this happening today, um, but I can only imagine living and being a citizen um, and the government saying, you know, hey, you can't meet 
in a public group with other people. You cannot have a, a town hall meeting. Public meetings were prohibited. Um, the government didn't want people to come together and and create maybe like, I, I guess maybe they were afraid of like citizen militias where people would come together and try and overthrow the government. I think that was a huge fear um, of too much communication. Certainly you'll see a theme throughout this introduction as you read that the British government at the time was afraid of what happens when just the common people start communicating and start thinking for themselves? Um, at this time period, you could, um, they suspended habeas corpus. Essentially, that means you could be in prison for anything. You'd be walking down the road, chewing bubblegum, and someone's like, you know what, I'm going to arrest you for that. That was legal. They suspended habeas corpus, which can't be wrongfully imprisoned. Well, suspending that means you can be wrongfully imprisoned, which means you can be in prison for anything. Um, so even people who just wanted slight political change had to, like, be worried because they could be charged with treason. Um, the government was afraid of the people. The government was afraid of the people having political information and political knowledge, especially the people who were being repressed by the current government system at the time. Um, the, there was, of course, the slave trade is not just an American thing. It's going on in Europe. Um, and so that's why, you know, in the previous slide, you see abolitionist ballads, um, abolitionist songs. People were, particularly women, actually, were um, vying for everyone's freedom, themselves and other people. And in some cases, women being the... Um, primary voice for some of the more marginalized people kind of kind of worked um not right away but um what else was going on why else were people using poetry to talk about politics well um the working or manufacturing class wanted a political vote they couldn't vote they couldn't um, unionized. So again, they couldn't come together to demand rights for themselves. Um, and even children had it bad. And these two things, I think, kind of go hand in hand. Like here, if you can see the screen, um, on the bottom right hand side of the screen, you see what looks like an, a person, but this is supposed to be drawn as a small child, um, pulling a cart in an extremely tight space to the point of where this person, this child has to crawl on their hands and knees, um, chained to a cart of coal that they are dragging through the mine. Um, and the people who owned the mines employed um, like obviously terrible working conditions, but they employed children as young as five which blows my mind. I There's no way. I mean, you do what you have to do. I get it. And this was, this is why the government was afraid of re the repressed people having information because how could you not stand up and, and fight for your rights as an, as an employee? How could you not unionize in this case? Um, and, and of course, then in the Victorian period, which, is, which postdates the Romantic period, we're going to see so much conversation about child labor and unfair um, labor laws and the lack of labor laws. And I think that um, the, the British government at the time was sort of adopting this laissez-faire, uh, well, capitalism will figure itself out, and if you, if there are people who are willing to work in these conditions for pay, then there's really nothing wrong with that, because they're gonna, they're gonna do it. Someone's gonna do it. And if, if it was so bad, no one would do it. Well, obviously that's not true, because people do what they have to do to survive, um, to put food on the table, and make a living for themselves. So, um, even children as young as five had it bad. Um, of course, women had to fight the patriarchy and uh, get creative. Um, they didn't get very far. But what is interesting is women, women have been seen as overly emotional um, and really just kind of like of the senses, I guess. So women could use that to their advantage in this case because 
what they ended up doing, and there's a section in your book that's going to explain this possibly better than I can right now, um, but what they ended up doing was saying, well, because I, a, a, a lonely woman who cannot control my emotions, which is the, the narrative at the time, um, because I can't control my emotions, well, I just feel so bad for these people and these children who have to work in these bad conditions and, um, you know, people who are Im wrongfully imprisoned and those who have been c held captive through this slave trade and who are being sold and, and don't have rights for themselves. And, and I'm just a woman who feels bad. So isn't there something that we can do? And so women have had the opportunity because of their own repressive voice and the own, their, the constraints put on them have even had the opportunity to kind of use that against the people that are repressing them. Again, it's going to take a really long time, but they're working on it. They're getting creative in this way. Um, so one of the other things, and I'm, I'm kind of changing a tune here a little bit, is something that I picked up on and found wholeheartedly fascinating. All right, so we have Britain in turmoil, and they're warring. But um, what a lot of the writers of the time did or picked up on, but I think helped cultivate, is this concept of what is it that the British military is trying to protect? Okay, so what, what does it mean to be English at the time? And the, the romantic poets start to kind of formulate this concept that I think even today we see as extremely British, which is the fireplace or the the, the fireside. Um, I think our book calls it the domestic fireside. So that's like your living room fireplace, right? Um, the, the concept here is, here is the, the safe space where you can relax, spend time with your family, uh, cozy up under a blanket or read a book. And if we don't protect this, then, then that part of your life, the safety of um, the home almost, is going to be taken away by someone else, probably the other, whoever that is. Um, and so then we start to see these images and these writings and the depiction of just being at home and the safety of that fireplace surrounding the living room, the mantle, um, as, as something that the British military has to protect and something that all of Britain has to protect. And you're going to start seeing fireplaces now being used as symbolic of safety, symbolic of the of all of the home. And so I have some pictures here. Um, the picture on the left is uh, some illustration rendition of a Hogwarts fireplace. I see a broomstick and I see Gryffindor robes, uh, wizard's chest, and it looks like Gryffindor patterned scarf or socks. I'm not really sure. Um, so we have sort of like this um, contemporary example of how fireplaces and British lit are really important, and that's that's coming out of this time period. Um, then we also have an image, and I cannot remember when this was painted, but this is a this is a, a painting from the time period, so sometime between 1776 and 1832, um, of a woman nursing her child by the fireside, just kind of where you can be your most relaxed state, in your most natural state, you don't have to worry. Um, and again, this is something that, that people, poets, politics are all trying to protect. Read the book to find out more. Um, so there's some shifts in poetry happening during the Romantic period. Prior to this shift occurring, a lot of the poetry were just a, a lot of objective descriptions, objective poems, of uh, objective feelings. Now we're looking at subjective interpretations or subjective feelings about nature. Um, here, previously, it's like, here's someone's face. Now it's like, here's how I feel about this person's face. Okay, does that make sense? Read the book. Um, prior to the shift, 
poetry is really seen as man's writing. And I think there's a, there's a lot of things that I want to say, and there's a lot of things I'm not really sure I'm going to get right here, but post-shift, there's a fear that, well, poetry isn't just for men anymore. And that meant now that writers were trying to hold on to the masculinity of poetry. Um, and it also meant that writers were concerned that even if they continued writing poetry, they're going to be depicting themselves as too feminine. If the shift in poetry is going from the objective to the subjective, from what I see to how I feel, then doesn't that mean then if poetry is man's writing, men are becoming more in touch with their feelings? So men were kind of really like these male poets really trying to hang on to the masculinity of poetry. And our book talks a little bit about how they do that, just in terms of trying to really define poetry as you know, effective. Poetry is genius. And really only men can be this genius, um, I think is kind of the interpretation that I read from the book. Um, the poetry shifted from just feelings before, you know, oh, I feel this way, I love this, blah, blah, to a self-revelation, disclosing the secret self, not just how I feel about it, but if this is how I feel about it, well, what does that say about me? Or how does that help me interpret my inner self? So there's a lot of self-reflection going on um, in Romantic period poetry. Um, prior to the Romantic period, and I mentioned this before, poetry was really governed by rules. You know, this poem has to have so many lines. It has to sound a certain way, and it has to use certain words, and these lines have to rhyme with these other lines, and it has to use this A, B, A, A pattern, whatever. Okay, so the Romantic period saw a shift to say, you know what, poetry doesn't have to be worked over in that way. Actually, really good poetry, the best poetry, should be spontaneous and impulsive. Again, I talked about that a little bit before. Um, so then, because of this, the heart and the head have become deeply connected, not really, but in theory, and that's what the poets are saying. Well, um, if I have great poetry, then that means I'm really in tune with my feelings, but I'm also extremely, very much a genius, according to the book. Tell me if you have a different interpretation here. So also, um, people are just writing about simple subjects, ordinary life objects. This gets back to that table talk that helps define the Romantic period. Um, but almost in contrast to that, this ordinary everyday life, are things that are beyond reason, things that are irrational almost, and that's supernatural themes, um, which again helps us kind of reconnect back to other themes like the psyche, and then self-sufficiency. The chapter talks about just how poets, poets were looking for and writing about their own autonomy, and some people didn't really like that. I think we're looking, getting close to the end. Um, during the Romantic period, there was a growth of what the book calls the reading public. So the common people started to get access to printed texts, to poems, to novels. Literacy is spreading. So more working class members are learning to read. They're learning to read at Sunday school. Um, and it's easier for them to get their hands on books. So they're not looking at like these gorgeous um, hardbound, gilded copies of texts because the elite could get all that, but um, working class people, even poor people, could probably get their hands on some cheaper prints. Technological developments in publishing made it less expensive to print books, um, to print pamphlets, things like that. And then also there were libraries coming out so you could rent a book for free. I think, um, and then just take it back when you're done. Um, not everyone saw this as a positive shift. Remember what I said at the beginning of this video, the government was afraid of common people, also people who are repressed or who are, you know, low on the totem pole, getting kind of the you know what end of the stick. Um, not everyone saw this growing reading public as a good thing because if people could read, and this is what the world is afraid of, right? Forever and ever. If people can read and understand 
then they start to have ideas about things. And if they have ideas about things that go beyond where their station is in life, then maybe they're going to start protesting it. And if they start protesting it, then maybe we're going to have to make a change in how I feel in my status quo might get disrupted. And then what happens then? So there's like this fear of the unknown, this fear of change. Um, and I'm probably explaining that in way more positive of a way as it, as it really was. Um, so people are theorizing that if politics can affect literature, so think back a couple slides. So if what's happening in the world people are writing about, well then isn't it possible that what people write about can change what's happening in the world? And, and I think this, go, this concept that politics and literature are inherently connected, this concept transcends any literary period because even today our authors are writing about um, striking up metaphors for political issues and societal issues and when we read about them even if it's fiction even if it's children's lit and we think it's you know no big deal people are writing about themes that are really really important and maybe that can change the way that we see each other and maybe that can change the way that we see the world and we can see this in in books as contemporary as and this is even a dated text in my opinion but as contemporary as harry potter so um it's, it's a fascinating thing to contemplate. Um, all right, getting back, though, to this time period, the British government tried to keep political reading material out of the hands of the poor. Um, again, they're trying to just keep the status quo the way that it is. Um, some, even women, though, worried about women reading. Um, oh, my gosh, what is going to happen when the women get their hands on knowledge? Uh oh, um, and then there were also a lot of copyright issues at the time. Um, the I don't think well, I am certain the laws were not as strict as they are today. Um, so there's copyright issues. The book talks about it. I have two more slides. Um, all right, other things. So. Um, there's the Edinburgh Review, Quarterly Review in the early 19th century. Um, our textbook says the critic is perhaps problematic. And I want to talk for a few minutes about why the textbook might be making this suggestion. So someone who's criticizing and the critic isn't just saying, well, I don't like this, I don't like this. It's really someone who's analyzing a text. And, we're, you know, we see this today, right? Scholarly articles, reviews, this isn't going away. Um, but at the time, and even today, someone who is a, a literary critic is not only going to denounce works that they don't feel have value and merit, but it's also going to stress and encourage the reading of works that they do feel has value and merit. Who would be a literary critic at the time? Probably someone who's well-read, likely a man, uh, likely a, probably a white man, maybe a woman, probably a man. Um, but so here we have this body of people, again, talking about why this could be problematic. We have a body of people saying, these are the best works that you should read because they hold the most literary value and merit to society. Well, what about all of the other works by likely more marginalized voices, people who these critics don't deem as worthy enough to be able to write, sometimes women, sometimes people of races other than white. So, it's perhaps problematic because critics can start to control what people even have access to and what's deemed as good, which then I think could fuel this um, additional marginalization of authors and texts that talk about themes, people, places that, that aren't... Th you know, what the critics would say are worthy of talking about, which is problematic. It's problematic for a few people to say, eh, 
this stuff isn't good enough, so we're not going to talk about it. And then for the world to be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, so one question I think is really interesting that we can still ask today is can critical prose, again, scholarly articles, reviews, um, can that function as literature? Or is it just criticism? Is criticism also literature if it's written? I don't know. What do you guys think? All right, a couple more slides here. Um, actually, I think this is the last one. The rest of the book, the rest of the chapter, I think the last like three or four pages, talks about other forms of writing, not just poetry. So it talks about prose, kind of recaps criticism. Um, it talks about drama and the novel, both of which are, are kind of in doing interesting things at the time periods. Of course, the Romantic period is defined by its lyric poem. That is the style of the Romantic period and the majority of readings from that period, especially with the major authors that you're going to find in our textbook, it's poetry. Um, critical prose is emerging. So again, these kind of like review style, oh, this was a good book. This was not a good book. Here are the merits of this play, etc. Um, plays were extremely regulated. Many were censored. So things that had themes that whoever censored these things, I don't think it was like exactly the government, but some body created to, again, stress or denounce the merits of some kind of play, um, they're going to censor things that they don't think the public should have access to, or if it's too political and they don't want it to incite a political uproar or too many people thinking about things, then they're going to say, no, 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 we cannot have a play about this. So during the, this time period, actually, um, not very many authors were doing new things with the play, and if they did want to become playwrights or write a play, they, they were probably just kind of keeping it to what we had seen previously um, with, with the sort of drama so far. Nothing too new was happening. The textbook will talk about, I think there's a couple of examples that are, are not like that. Um, Shelley wrote a play, it had incest in it, definitely got censored. Okay, so then we have the novel. Some interesting things are happening with the novel. Um, really, up until we're well into the Victorian period, and, and probably through part of the Victorian period, the novel was becoming extremely popular, but it was also not very well respected. So what I, I guess the best way that I can explain this is like, think about all the literature that you're asked to read in a literature course, stereotypically. So you're Shakespeare and you're Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, um, works contemporary authors who everyone says like you must read them, their work is so good. And then you have something like Fifty Shades of Grey or that penny novel that you threw under your bed because you randomly read it and you picked it up at the grocery store or something like that. There's a difference here, my hands, there's a difference here between like what society deems as really literary versus um, just popular, easy reads, things that aren't too controversial, political. Um, that's like what was going on with the novel back then. The novel was the Fifty Shades of Grey or that penny novel you got at the grocery store. It wasn't really literature. It was just so popular. Everyone could get one. I think they, they said something about like novel mills. I was just putting it out there for anyone to read. Um, it's the trashy novel. Okay, so the, in this time period, nobody even needed to say that a novel was trashy because all novels were trashy in theory, according to these people. Okay, um, so why was the novel seen as not something to be respected? Um, many critics, I'm guessing, possibly also authors, felt as if writing a novel didn't really require as much skill as writing a play or um, writing some type of critical prose or even writing a poem. So they're like, well, anyone can do it. Yay, so what? You wrote a novel. I don't think that's necessarily the feeling of today, but I'm not, I don't know. Um, critics of the novel also 
also uh, were concerned about like women and the novel. So they realized that a lot of women were reading novels and even more so many women, I think our book says like just as many women were writing novels as men. Um, and so the world again is super worried about women reading things because there is still during this time period the belief that women had one place in society and that was in the home. They should be mothers, they should be caregivers, they should be wives. And that's where they're too emotional to deal with politics, they're too emotional to deal with society, they just need to stay in the kitchen. Okay, so what if women are reading about other women not being in the kitchen? Now women are going to do stuff and like, oh my gosh, that's so wild. Um, so that's, that's something, okay, if women are reading novels, uh, then this novels can't be that political because honestly, people are probably thinking, how could a woman even understand anything that's more than just like a love, tr a trashy love story, something like that. Um, and so again, novels are leading to the public reading and the government is afraid of that. What if the people who are repressed the most realize it and they realize that they're reading a novel? Um, and so the novel was seen as irrespectable, irrespectable, is that a word? I don't know. Um, until about 1814. What happened in 1814? I don't know. Maybe your history teacher could tell you. Um, and then we see this like gothic novel revival of gothic locations like castles, which is fascinating to me. Um, and all of like this underground space. And I think then the novel started to become something that could function as a metaphor for society and the novel because it could be so much fiction could give people the opportunity to use their imagination not just about what they're reading on the page but then about what they're seeing in real life and ask questions about the world so that's kind of what's going on there um i think this is my last slide yes it is I hope this helps you better understand the content within the chapter. Um, I apologize for this being such a long video, but if you have any questions uh, and you haven't already read the chapter, or if you have read the chapter and you have questions, please feel free to send me an email.